Hi everybody, uh, I'm your host Piali and I welcome you all to this webinar. Today we have a very special guest with us. We have Mr. Peter Green from California. Peter uh, is an agile leadership coach and a certified scrum trainer as well. And today he will talk about, uh, it's like his topic is the emergence of agile organizations. And he will tell us about several organizations that take an agile approach uh, throughout the company, just not in the team level. So uh, it's an interesting topic. And uh, for the format of the session, as you know, it's the one hour session. Peter will take care of the questions towards the end of the session. And uh, you can type your questions in the chat box so he can uh, read out the questions and take care of them. So over to you, Peter. You can take the show forward. Great. Thank you so much, Piali, and thanks, everybody, for joining this evening. Um, a little bit about me, for those of you who might not be familiar with my background. Uh, I've been a, a, a user of Agile approaches since 2005. Um, I first heard about Scrum in 2005 from Jeff Sutherland when he gave a presentation at my company. I was working for Adobe at the time, and I was a program manager for the audio products at Adobe. And Jeff gave about a one hour presentation on this new thing called Scrum that I had never heard of before. And we started using that for my team uh, on the audio products at Adobe. And we really enjoyed using it. We got a lot of benefit from it. Uh, it seemed to, to make everything run a little bit better on our team. And we started getting better results. And other teams in the organization started noticing that. And, and they started asking me to tell them more about this Scrum thing. And so I would, I would describe Scrum to them. And, and then they would say, well, could you help us start? And so I would give them a little bit of short training and, and a little bit of coaching as they started getting going. And uh, I started having that experience more and more frequently at Adobe. Uh, so within about three years, uh, there was enough interest and demand uh, that we shifted my full-time role at Adobe uh, in 2008 uh, to helping other teams learn about Scrum and Agile. And that remained my job at Adobe for about seven years. Uh, and during that time, we saw Scrum really proliferate in the organization. And at the team level, it was working very well. Uh, and then it started to, you know, as, as multiple teams in an organization, in a part of the organization, uh, started to get the benefits of Scrum. Then at the director level, uh, there was some awareness of what Agile was. And uh, eventually over time, there was some awareness at the vice president level and even at the CEO level of what Scrum did and, and was, was able to accomplish. But it seemed like we hit like a ceiling of what Agile was, was able to accomplish at some point. Uh, and so I started getting really curious about, you know, what does Scrum look like if, if even at the leadership level, they really understand Agile? And as I started that search, uh, an interesting thing happened, which is that I didn't find many examples of organizations that had started with Scrum and now we're using it throughout the organization, including at the leadership level. But I did find a lot of other interesting organizations that took a very agile approach uh, that, that hadn't started with Scrum. Uh, and so as I studied those, I started to see some patterns emerge and that's, that's really what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, to start with that, I want to talk about, you know, wh where, why this is happening in the world. So uh, there's a term that uh, comes from uh, the military, um, and that term is VUCA. And some of you might have heard of this before. What this stands for, the V stands for volatile, meaning that there's a high pace of change. Things are changing much more rapidly than they were 10, 20, certainly 50 years ago. Uh, the U stands for uncertain, meaning that outcomes are are far less predictable than they used to be in the past. Uh, the C stands for complex. So there are many, many more variables uh, in, in the work that we do today. And then finally, A stands for ambiguous. And ambiguous means that the meaning of things is unclear. So we might have data about something, but how we interpret that data is very unclear. And so in this world that, uh, again, the military calls VUCA, uh, we really need different approaches to how we organize and run organizations. So, so a few examples of this, uh, just to illustrate the point of how things are changing. Uh, this is a, a graph of the lifespan of a company on the S&P 500, which is one of the major uh, indexes uh, for in the US stock market. 
Now you can see that going back to the 20s and, and 30s, um, a century ago, companies stayed on the S&P 500 for quite some time. And then as we go uh, further and further down the timeline, the lifespan is, is roughly one-fifth of what it used to be uh, on average. So there's a lot higher turnover of organizations than we used to see. So that's one example of, of volatility and uncertainty. Another example of this is if we just look at large companies that no longer exist. Uh, it's interesting. In the U.S., there's a large uh, toy company called Toys R Us, which has just declared bankruptcy. So I would need to update this slide to put another, <laughs> to put another gravestone in the, in the cemetery here. Uh, but major companies, Kodak, you know, for, for 100 years being the market leader, uh, Kodak actually invented digital photography but was unable as an organization to take advantage of that. And so they were uh, eventually put out of business by digital photography as one example. So we see companies that seem stable and seem like they'll be around forever uh, suddenly going out of business. Uh, another example of this uh, is uh, the number of users of the Internet creates greater complexity, creates greater opportunity in other parts of the world that wasn't there before. And when I, when I first started uh, talking about this, these were the numbers about 2015. Uh, I went and checked uh, recently to see how this has changed. And uh, interestingly, all of these numbers are up. Tremendous growth in Asia, uh, growth in Europe. Africa has, uh, has gone above Latin America and the Caribbean. So these numbers have changed tremendously, even in, in essentially two years. Uh, so we see this uh, proliferation of connection uh, and capability and access to information that we didn't have. Uh, another example of this uh, is if we look at uh, the the growth of uh, autumn, uh, excuse me, uh, of AI, artificial intelligence, we start to see this impacting all kinds of industries. So this is a picture, of course, of a, a Tesla in autopilot mode, which is using a tremendous amount of artificial intelligence to help pilot the vehicle. And I can imagine in five to 10 years that this will be a common thing on the roads. And you start to see whole industries changing uh, in the US uh, around uh, self-driving vehicles. You know, the trucking industry in the United States is a huge, uh, you know, employs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, and those people's jobs will begin to phase out just like in the US we have uh, taxi drivers being replaced with Uber drivers. And so we see a lot of just complexity and volatility in the marketplace and artificial intelligence driving a lot of that. Uh, we see the proliferation of these small little computers, supercomputers in our pocket. Uh, and related to internet access, of course, uh, our mobile devices now uh, put essentially all of the connection, all of the power of a computer that, that used to be the top of the line. Uh, we have that computing power in our pockets and proliferating everywhere. And this is, is one of my favorite things about when I travel to India, is seeing everywhere I go, everybody on their mobile device, no matter age, no matter uh, uh, wealth, we see this everywhere. And so we see really a democratization of uh, computing power in the world. Um, another example here is related to factory automation. So this has had a huge impact on uh, industry where more and more we see robots doing the work that people used to do. Uh, I saw an interesting video recently of a factory, a Mercedes factory in Germany. And uh, it was about a 10 minute video. And they were basically following a single vehicle through the entire production line. In that 10 minute video, the first human being did not appear until about eight minutes into the video. And then finally, some human beings were, were starting to do some of the work. So this is a tremendous upheaval uh, in the manufacturing space. Uh, the final example that I'd like to give here uh, is uh, a story that went viral in the United States. And unfortunately, this company, United Airlines, has been in the news several times uh, since this first. Uh, really one of the first instances of a viral video that impacted a company was a, a musician in the US who uh, was a guitar player and had a, a really expensive uh, uh, kind of old guitar uh, that was that was really special to him would be almost impossible to replace. And when he tried to get on the airplane, they wouldn't let him bring it on the plane. 
They said, there's no space on the plane. Um, you need to check it. And he said, well, this is a fragile instrument. If I check it, I'm worried that it'll be hurt. And they said, no, 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 no worries, sir. Uh, we'll take good care of it. And uh, being concerned about the guitar, as he got on the plane, he was looking out the window and he saw the baggage handlers just tossing the guitar case uh, onto the conveyor belt and it, and it dropping onto the, you know, into the plane. And so, of course, he, he was worried about that. And so he started videoing it. He, start, he pulled out his phone. He started recording it. Uh, and then he recorded when he got the guitar back at the other end of it. And uh, the guitar was broken. The neck was broken in half, basically irreplaceable at this point. If that had happened 30 or 40 years ago, he would have complained to his friends. His friends would have said, oh, that's terrible. And probably nothing would have changed. But because he had videotaped the incident, and because this new tool called YouTube was available, he, he decided to write a song. And since he was a musician, he wrote a song called United Breaks Guitars. And he included footage of the guitar incident on the airplane, all the video that he had shot. Uh, and that video went viral. And the next day, United Airlines stock dropped 10%. Uh, so we've had multiple instance of, uh, instances of this where the customer, the consumer, is really in charge now. They can really impact a business uh, due to social media and viral videos and these types of things. Uh, all these things are examples of, of situations that didn't exist, capability that didn't exist 50 years ago. So these are all examples of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity going up in the world. And if you look at what is causing all of this, uh, the primarily, primary root cause of almost every one of these examples is technology. Right? The technology is enabling uh, the pace of change to go up. Tremendous opportunity that comes with that uh, throughout the world. And so it's a great thing, but it's also causing uh, us to look at how we run an organization and saying, are we able to keep up with this level of complexity, with this pace of change? So luckily, uh, technology causes it, and some of the solutions to this come from the technology space. Right? And if we look at agile software development as an example of that, Agile emerged because the software industry was one of the first spaces to really experience this rate of change. Right? And the soft this, this is standard. We're, we're aware that things change every week, every month, uh, and that if we don't keep up, we won't be able to compete. So Agile software development really emerged to address this level of complexity. And so we start to get some answers uh, from the Agile space. Now, a lot of people, when they hear Agile, they think immediately of Scrum. Uh, the most common Agile approach, but not the only one. And I think it's important that we remind ourselves that Agile is not just Scrum. Uh, Agile is a set of values, right? If we look at the Agile Manifesto, we have these values. And so we start to see values like these and the principles as well, uh, not only as better ways to do software development, but as better ways to address this VUCA world that we're living in, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, we start to realize that it, we can't rely on processes and tools to address that complexity. We have to rely on individuals interacting with each other. They are the ones that can sense these changes and that can take action on it. And if we rely on processes and tools, it tends to be too slow to keep pace. And the processes and tools, they don't care. The individuals and interactions do. So we need people that are aware of change and care about it. Uh, valuing, you know, working software over comprehensive documentation. By the time we've written out a detailed specification, the world has changed. It's too late. And so we focus on doing a little bit and adding some value and getting feedback. Again, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. This can't be a, uh, a win-lose proposition. Uh, when we're in this VUCA world, we need to be able to collaborate with our customers. Uh, we need them to view us as being on the same team. Uh, the, the United Breaks Guitars was not viewed as we're on the same team here. This was, well, you know, our contract says you can't take the, the guitar on the, on the airplane. So too bad for you. Uh, however, if, if the company had been able to take a more collaborative approach with their customer, we probably would have seen a different outcome there. And of course, then responding to change over following a plan becomes much and much, much more important uh, when the pace of change is so high. So Agile is really more than a set of processes. Agile is a mindset. It's a way of thinking about things. Right? It's made up of those four values, as well as some more specific principles, and then really an infinite number of practices that can be aligned with that mindset. 
it's also part of an evolution. We've started to see, you know, if we look back 100 years, we can see that Agile is not something completely different. It's not radically different. It's an evolution of thinking. And so if we go back 100 years from now, uh, we see Taylor scientific management as really the, the thing that uh, caused uh, a great deal of new wealth to be created, a new prosperity in the world. Uh, a lot of Agilists like to bash Taylorism, saying, oh, that's a terrible non-human way to work. But I think it's important to remember that uh, Taylor was the Agile of its day. The scientific management movement was the Agile of its day. Uh, you know, if we look at uh, 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 one example of that. Um, Jeff Sutherland's most recent book is called Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time, right? And, and Jeff consistently talks about getting 10x the uh, productivity out of a Scrum team that's doing, doing Scrum well. Uh, Taylor had almost the exact same message at his time. Taylor was consistently able to go into a factory, and these were factories that were doing things like turning iron into steel, for example. And he was able to consistently go in and, and create, uh, multiply the throughput of a factory by 10x. So we see that Taylor really was the agile of his day, right? Uh, really standardizing processes, making tools uh, better. But in the 30s, we start to see this idea of, of organizations as a military unit where we, you know, we have people that, were, uh, that, that had served in military leadership positions uh, during world wars and things like that, who were who were coming back into the private sector and uh, taking leadership roles in organizations, and they would use what they had learned in the military, as far as structures and uh, and communication approaches, uh, that and this helped corporations really grow, starting in the 1930s and even continuing on into the 40s and 50s. So we see these these structures as the most common structures in organizations today, and those are really patterned after the military. Then when we get into the 1950s, uh, start to see some changes. Uh, some new ideas coming into how we look at organizations. Uh, one of those was W. Edwards Deming, who was uh, talk talking about something he called the total quality management movement. Now TQM had uh, a kind of a core tenet that we should do short feedback loops, that we should constantly be trying to improve and learn. Uh, and so he had his plan, do, check, act approach. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this, PDCA cycles, sometimes called plan, do, study, act, depending on which version of Deming you're reading. Uh, and so we start to see feedback loops being built into organizations uh, with Deming. The other important change that happened in the 50s uh, was a book by uh, a, a professor at MIT named Douglas McGregor. Now, McGregor wrote this book called The Human Enterprise. And in this book, he posited that there were two theories of motivation, of human motivation. He called these theory X and theory Y. He said theory X essentially states that human beings um, are inherently lazy. Uh, the only thing that motivates humans to work are incentives or disincentives, what we might call carrots and sticks. And so the idea in theory X was in order to get people to work hard, you had to give them a financial incentive to do it or some kind of a punishment if they didn't do it. And he said, this is theory X. He said, but there's also another theory of motivation, what he called theory Y. And he said, theory Y states that for human beings, work is as natural as sleep, play, or eat. Uh, it's just a natural core human characteristic, uh, but an organization might do things that would detract from that or that don't amplify that. And so um, McGregor said, in, in a theory Y organization, we would treat people as if they are inherently motivated to work, and we would create systems and structures that don't need to create a financial incentive. They just try to make work an, an engaging place to be. And in the 70 years since McGregor's book, uh, we, we've seen a tremendous amount of research that backs that up. We've also seen that both theories can be true. And what I mean by that is in an organization that treats people as if theory X is true, the people behave as if theory X is true. And in an organization that treats people as if theory Y is true, the people behave as if theory Y is true. Uh, so interesting outcomes from that. Uh, the, the research on it shows that a theory Y organization uh, is at least as effective as a theory X organization. Uh, and when we are in a VUCA world again, they're far more effective. So if things are stable, theory X can work uh, and theory Y can work. 
when things are rapidly changing, theory X is much less effective and theory Y is more effective. So those were two kind of critical things that happened in the 1950s. And notice that those, those patterns emerging are aligned with really the beginning of technology starting to proliferate. Then in the 70s, we see kind of a refinement of these ideas, um, the most common of which was Toyota's um, uh, production system, usually referred to today as lean manufacturing. So lean was really an integration of these ideas of fast feedback loops, as well as treating people as if they're naturally motivated, smart, creative, resourceful workers. Uh, so Toyota was, was famous for saying things like, um, we, we can always outcompete our, our, our uh, competitors because we actually trust our workers and they don't. That's a very theory-wise statement. Uh, at Toyota, I, I read a, a statistic recently that there were something like two million suggestions from employees during a calendar year. Uh, and many of us have, you know, employee suggestion boxes and those kind of things. At Toyota, the, of the two million suggestions, 98% of them were implemented that year. So we see that there's a real trust in the people doing the work to help shape how the work is done. So when we get to the 90s and we look at agile software development, we realize this is not a brand new idea. It's really an evolution of existing ideas. And as the complexity goes up, the need for a, a more human-centric approach to work and the need for faster feedback loops grows. And what we're going to look at today is really this emergence of what does that look like at the organizational level? Right. We kind of know how to do agile software development at the team level. Uh, there's certainly challenges in doing it, and it still takes some work to get software, to, software developers working well in an agile way at the team level. Uh, but we're now seeing the concepts from agile start to spread throughout the organization. So that's where we're going to go, is we're going to look at uh, this. You know, As VUCA goes up, we see greater capability in these new patterns uh, to address that. And we're going to focus really on this shift between agile software development to agile organizations with a few examples. So as I went out and studied uh, these companies, like I was t uh, saying at the beginning of the webinar, uh, I was surprised to find that there were not very many examples of organizations that had started with agile at the team level and then spread that up uh, throughout the organization. I did find a few of those, uh, but not too many. I found many, many more examples of organizations that had started with a conviction that we should treat people better. And uh, that led them to create practices that we would look at and say, that's a pretty agile practice. It's very similar to patterns from agile software development. But they didn't start with Scrum, for example. Uh, they started with principles. And so look at as eight shifts uh, from a traditional principle to a more agile principle at the organizational level, and I'll give an example for each of those eight shifts. So the first shift that I found was very common in these organizations was a shift from a focus on shareholder value to a focus on customer delight and shared purpose. Now, shareholder value is a tough one because, at least in the United States, it's the legal requirement of a director of a public corporation to maximize shareholder value. Uh, and so these organizations that we're making this sh sh towards customer delight and shared purpose, uh, had to be very careful about that. They, they had to do both. They had to say, we will maximize shareholder value, but we're going to do that over the long term through a focus on customer delight and shared purpose. So one example of an organization like this is Zappos. Uh, Zappos was fairly recently acquired by Amazon, uh, over a billion dollar acquisition. Zappos started its life out as a, an online shoe retailer. And uh, Tony Shea is, is the CEO of uh, Zappos. This is a picture of Tony uh, in the cover of his book. And you can see his book is called Delivering Happiness. And Tony started out with this principle that he said, we will uh, let our people figure out how to make our customers happy, and they can do whatever they need to do to make our customers happy, and that's how we're going to drive growth. Uh, Tony has said things like, our customer su support representatives are our marketing department. We don't have a marketing department because if our customer service reps, our CSRs, are doing great customer service, then our customers will do our marketing for us. Uh, and so uh, a few examples of this in their company is that there is no uh, tracked call time. 
Uh, that's not true. They do record how long calls take, uh, but there's no target for minimizing the amount of time any given uh, customer support call takes. In fact, they celebrate the long calls. Uh, so there's no script that their CSRs follow. Uh, they get on the phone and their job is to delight their customers. Uh, and so a few examples of this is that uh, somebody called the Zappos customer support line and, and said, you know, we're having a hard time finding some, some uh, carry out pizza here, some delivery pizza here in this hotel we're staying at. Could you help us? And the customer support representative said, um, okay, so you're not interested in buying shoes? And they said, no, 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 but you guys have always been so helpful. Could you help us find some pizza? And so the customer support rep looked on, you know, Google or Yelp or something, and and uh, found a nice delivery pizza in their area and said, "Here, you should call them." And they hung up. And rather than being punished for spending time on that, uh, Tony Shea actually heard about it and he told that story at a customer, or excuse me, at a company all hands meeting, as an example of great customer service. That whoever that was that called asking about pizza is going to love Zappos for life now. And so they're gonna tell all their friends, Zappos is the place to go. Uh, so this focus on customer delight and shared purpose has led to huge uh, revenue growth for them. Uh, starting in, I think the company was founded in 2008 uh, and had a, an annual revenue of 10 million. Uh, within five years, they had an annual revenue of 1 billion. So huge company growth with zero marketing. It was all about delighting customers. So this is an example of a real shift uh, from a focus on shareholder value where we're really looking at, you know, maximizing efficiency of processes and people to focusing on delighting customers and trusting that that will lead to shareholder value and shared purpose. So the second shift uh, is a shift from predicting and controlling to experimenting to learn. Now this is closely related uh, to this concept of VUCA, right? When uh, if things are not volatile, if things are not uncertain or complex or ambiguous, then the right business decision to make is to predict what we're gonna do and then control to it. It's more efficient to do that. However, when the world is changing rapidly around us, uh, predicting and controlling is an exercise in frustration. We can't predict what's gonna happen six months from now, let alone one year or five years from now. Uh, we can set goals, we can have a purpose around what we'd like to see the company do over that time span, but we really can't predict what's gonna happen. And so we see uh, organizations, instead of taking this approach, they're taking a, an approach of experimenting to learn. We can see this deep roots in the agile movement here, right? Uh, where we could, we could view sprints in a scrum team as two week experiments. What can we learn in the next two weeks? Uh, what value can we deliver? And how can we learn from that? Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, one of the few examples of a company that started out doing scrum at the side for team level. So Geonetric is a, uh, a, a, um, a company in the medical services field. Uh, they do things like build out websites for large hospitals, uh, those types of, those types of uh, uh, that type of industry. Uh, Geonetric uh, first started using Scrum, oh, I'd say about six years ago, I think, six, seven years ago. Uh, at the software team level, and they started seeing a lot of benefit at it. And the CEO at the time, uh, a gentleman named Eric Engelman, said, well, this is really interesting. Uh, it seems to be working well at the software team level. How, how might we apply this throughout the company? Uh, and so started talking about that idea, and one day uh, said, you know what, I'm, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that this agile approach is a better way to run the entire company. So he called an, an all-hands meeting the next day, and he said, starting today, Everybody in this company is going to be organized into scrum teams, including myself and the, the other executives on the, on the uh, executive leadership team. We are going to form a scrum team, and we're going to do two-week sprints, and we're going to hold sprint reviews. And everybody in the organization did that. Now, Eric, uh, interestingly, was recently made the chairman of the board for the Scrum Alliance. Uh, so Eric has stepped aside as CEO. And the photograph you see here is of Linda Barnes, who's the current CEO of Geonetric. Uh, when I talk to Linda, Linda says that uh, she no longer tries to create large strategic plans. She comes up with strategic ideas about ways to do things, but she's recognized through this experience of, of using Scrum throughout the organization that everything is an experiment. And so if you look at something like how do we set salaries if everybody's on a Scrum team and nobody has a direct manager, 
She said, we ran about 10 different experiments with how to set salaries before we found something that worked in our culture. Uh, we didn't just go out and say, here's the new way and everybody do it. We actually ran experiments. Hey, what if this team did it this way? And let's try this team, try it this way and see what works. And they experimented to learn. Uh, now, every time there's a new opportunity or a new challenge, uh, the first question for Linda, the CEO, is what experiment we can, can we run and what might we be able to learn from that experiment? All right, moving along here. The third shift uh, is a shift from a focus on uh, efficiency uh, to engagement and adaptability. So if we look at an example of 100% of efficiency, uh, if something is 100% efficient, that means it is perfectly tailored to do the job it was built to do. There's no waste in that system. However, if 100% of the resources of that tool or that person or that system are spent uh, delivering what was expected, then there is 0% opportunity to adapt. There's no spare cycle to adapt. And so we need to find somewhere on a spectrum from efficiency, which is still important, uh, to engagement and adaptability. And the greater the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, the more we need engagement and adaptability uh, in order to address that. So one example of this uh, uh, is from the military. So this is a, a photograph of what is essentially a 2,000 person daily scrum meeting. Uh, the gentleman who is not uh, at the right, the gentleman to the left of the person at the right, is General Stanley McChrystal. And Stanley McChrystal was the commander of the Joint Special Ops Operations Command in Iraq uh, during the Iraq War. And their job was to defeat Al Qaeda. And when McChrystal took the job, uh, he was treating Al Qaeda like a traditional army. And he said the, the enemy at this point did not act like a traditional army. They didn't have hierarchical structures. They weren't following a battle plan. They were a network. And our traditional approach to fighting an enemy did not work. And so he said, we really had to completely change everything about how we were organized in order to keep up with this more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous uh, challenge that we were facing. So one of the things that they did is they took this meeting that used to be just the generals and, and some of the higher level uh, people in the organization, uh, what they called a, a, a intelligence and operations meeting. And they opened it up to the entire organization, 2,000 people. And in fact, they made it a requirement that if you were not currently on, a, you know, on, on, on the ground doing the work, that you had to call into this meeting. So that sounds like a crazy thing uh, because it took two hours a day. So 2,000 people in a two hour meeting. Imagine if your daily scrum went two hours every day and there were 2,000 people there. That seems like a highly inefficient way to use people's time. And McChrystal said that may have been an inefficient way to use people's time, but because everybody was in the room, they were able to adapt much more quickly. If, if they were aware of a new opportunity, uh, somebody could bring the opportunity up in this meeting if that opportunity required shifting resources and uh, helicopters and uh, you know, uh, intelligence capabilities around, they could make that decision immediately. And so he measured the efficient, or excuse me, the, uh, the effectiveness. He measured the effectiveness before the meeting and after the meeting, and effectiveness went up 1,700%, meaning that they were aware of an opportunity, they were able to execute on the opportunity. So they biased towards engagement and, and adaptability, and they were willing to give up some of their efficiency in order to do that. So it's a very interesting example of this shift. All right, shift number four is a shift from directed groups to autonomous teams. Now, this is something that uh, in, in the agile world, in the agile software world, we're very familiar with, that uh, there's a, a focus on self-organizing cross-functional teams in Scrum, for example. And yet, even when we have autonomous teams, if those are still you know, kind of directed from above uh, and part of an organization structure where they don't really have an empowered product owner, for example, we, we might still struggle. So an organization that has really been a great example of this is a home healthcare organization in the Netherlands called Buurtzorg. So this is an organization that was founded uh, by a gentleman named Jas de Bloch, and, and he, was a, he was a director level person at another home healthcare organization in the Netherlands. And he was getting more and more frustrated that the nurses were being told how to do their jobs. They were being told they had four minutes to administer an insulin shot. 
And if they were going over that four minutes, then they were going to be docked pay. Notice the theory X in that approach, right? You, you have only this amount of time. And they said nurses didn't get into this to be efficient uh, administrators of an insulin shot. They got into this to take care of people. And so he founded this company called Bjertsorg. And he said at Bjertsorg, the nurses make all the decisions and they'll do that in small teams. And today Bjertsorg is over 12,000 nurses uh, organized completely in autonomous teams. And a, a team of nurses like the one in the photograph here uh, has complete autonomy to how they run nursing in their neighborhood. Uh, they get to choose if they should hire somebody. They get to figure out how to schedule people. They get to figure out everything about the administration of the work. And what that has done is allowed the nurses to focus on taking care of people. Now, Bjertsorg, since its founding, uh, has become the largest home health care organization in the Netherlands within a very short time span and by far the most effective uh, since uh, the Netherlands has a, uh, a socialized health care system. Uh, the people that at the end of the day pay their bills are the government. And so the government has done quite a bit of studying to say, is this crazy autonomous company, are, are they actually effective at what they do? And uh, that research that, that was done by an independent third party uh, found that indeed uh, Bjertsorg is responsible for saving the uh, the country of the Netherlands uh, billions of dollars a year because even though they're not focused on efficiency, they are more efficient. They're more effective at their jobs. Uh, patients are not in healthcare as long. Uh, they have better outcomes. Uh, they're more efficient uh, in general. So interestingly, when we stop focusing on efficiency and start focusing on allowing people to do the job that they love, up in this organization. There is no management structure. Uh, so we talk about directed groups. Uh, the entire home office, including the executives and support staff, is about 30 people uh, for a 12,000 person organization. So a completely flat organizational structure, essentially. All right, shifting into number five. Uh, we start to see this shift from rigid hierarchies uh, going back to that organization as military structure that we saw emerging in the 30s to more human systems, systems that are more dynamic and built around how human beings tend to interact. Uh, a really interesting example of that is uh, a company in California called Morningstar. And Morningstar is a tomato processing plant and they're responsible for about two thirds of the tomato products in the United States. Uh, Morningstar is another company that has no management structure. Uh, nobody reports to anybody else. Well, that's probably not quite accurate. Uh, the probably more accurate way to say that is uh, everybody reports to everybody. Now that might sound like chaos, but they actually put in some fairly uh, um, detailed structures to, to allow that. Uh, the primary structure that they use to help people manage the work is something that, something that they call a colleague letter of understanding. And so since I don't have a boss, what I really do is make agreements with people that I work with. And so if we look at this tomato processing line, uh, there are about 10 people in this photograph. These 10 people work together, they do similar work. And each of these people, at least annually, will sit down and write down uh, what they are willing to be responsible for and what they're willing to be held accountable for. Uh, and then they will discuss that, what they call this colleague letter of understanding with the other nine colleagues. And they say, here are the responsibilities that I'm willing to take. They'll also say, and here is what salary I think I should be given for that. And because everybody's salary is transparent, uh, they found that uh, there was some concern that maybe since I get to set my own salary, I will just decide to set my salary at, uh, you know, as high as I want. What they found is that because everybody that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis knows what everybody else is making, uh, more often than not, people would set their salary lower than they should have uh, because there's social pressure to, you know, to, to set a salary that's reasonable compared to my peers. So no management structure again here doing pretty traditional work, right? We're processing tomatoes on a plant. It's actually not a tremendously volatile industry, but they found that these human systems are more, uh, even more adept at doing this type of work to where they are the market leader in their field. Uh, number six then is a shift from structured communications to radical transparency. Uh, this is an interesting one. When I was at Adobe, which is a pretty, uh, uh, in, in some ways forward thinking, and in some ways they've got some traditional uh, structures built into it. One of the things that was a pretty traditional approach is that there was a real control uh, to how communication was done. 
Uh, and so I would often work with uh, vice presidents about, you know, rolling out a new change. And oftentimes there would be a, a desire to control the message. And so they would spend quite a bit of time getting the announcement just right and crafting the PowerPoints uh, to be, you know, completely clear. Uh, and then three weeks after a decision would make would be made, finally the communication would get rolled out in this big rollout. And yet year after year, the, the surveys, the employee surveys said, uh, communication is the number one challenge with leadership. We don't get enough communication. So the structured approach to communication was slowing things down and was preventing natural conversations from happening. An organization that has gone completely the other direction uh, is a company called Bridgewater Financial. Now, Bridgewater is the most successful hedge fund company in the world. Uh, Bridgewater is one of the few um, financial investment companies that consistently beats the stock market indexes. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever looked at, at investing, uh, you may have heard that uh, the best investment is just to invest in an index tracking fund because it's very difficult to beat the market over the long term. Bridgewater is one of the very few that I've ever read about that consistently outperforms the, the standard uh, index tracking funds and by a large measure. Uh, the CEO of Bridgewater, a guy named Ray Dalio, uh, says that Bridgewater is an idea meritocracy. That's their structure. In other words, the best idea should always win. And he said, but in order to do that, we have to address the fact that human beings are imperfect decision makers they're very biased about what their own weaknesses and strengths are, and they don't always make the best decision. And so what he has done is create an, a culture of radical transparency in service of this idea of the best idea is always winning. So a few examples of this radical transparency at Bridgewater. Uh, the first one is that every meeting at the company is recorded. The audio is recorded unless there's going to be client sensitive information shared at that meeting. Uh, every meeting is recorded. So every one-on-one -on -one discussion between a manager and a direct report is recorded. Every conference call is recorded. And those recordings are posted on an internal intranet and they are available to every employee to download and listen to. Uh, and this is, the idea behind this is that um, in order for people to improve, they have to be able to hear feedback. And so in some ways this is not only radical transparency but brutal honesty. Uh, Bridgewater is written, a, one, one of the books about, that discusses Bridgewater is a book called um, An Everyone Culture by Robert Keegan, where he talks about organizations that are deliberately developmental. In other words, they see the development of people's skills and awareness as a core part of the business. And Bridgewater is one example of that. Um, very fascinating uh, organization to look up. Uh, complete transparency. Nothing is hidden there. Uh, including your own weaknesses. Everybody's aware and you're expected to be aware of them and to be working on them because then we'll make better decisions. Uh, and that has certainly uh, played out in the market there. All right, just a couple more shifts here and then we'll have some time for, some, for a few questions here. Um, the next shift is a shift from complicated processes uh, to simple rules. Uh, and in the complex adaptive systems science field uh, where we study complex systems, uh, one of the core tenets is that you cannot control a complex system, period. However, you can influence it. And when we, when we want to influence complex systems, the best way to do that is with a few simple rules. And so one source of information there is uh, Gloria Ouyang, uh, who founded the Human Systems Dynamics Institute. So simple rules, I'll give you an example of one of these. Uh, the Ritz-Carlton, a large hotel chain, uh, wants, they, they also have a, a real focus on customer delight, kind of like the Zappos example. But they're a great example of this idea of simple rules. And so the Ritz-Carlton has a simple rule, they have a few of them, but one of the simple rules is that any employee, no matter their tenure, no matter their job title, uh, is allowed to spend up to 2,000 US dollars uh, to help a customer feel satisfied without an expense report, without a justification for it. Uh, and so if, if a janitor who is repairing a doorknob notices that a customer is upset, they're expected to talk to the customer and see what's going on. And if there's anything that they can do to help that customer feel happy, they will do it. And they can spend up to 2,000 US dollars 
to fix that problem immediately without getting an approval. So it's a very simple rule. If you notice something going on with one of our guests, take care of it immediately and spend up to $2,000. And so you might imagine a situation where, uh, you know, a checkout took too long or a, the receipt didn't show up in time. And so somebody's running behind now and they're worried they're going to miss their flight. Uh, well, a Ritz-Carlton employee would have the authority to say, you know what, if I can get you to the airport in 10 minutes instead of an hour, uh, would you be happy? And they would say, yes, that's my concern. They would be able to charter a helicopter <laughs> and fly them to the airport. That would be completely within the rules. Uh, so it's an example of simple rules. And you start to see what kind of a culture that creates when anybody in the organization is empowered to make decisions to take care of customers. So there are lots of organizations that create simple rules like this. You might even see uh, some of the Agile frameworks as a set of simple rules, like Kanban is a great example of a few simple rules, right? Visualize all the work, limit work in progress, and improve flow through the system. Three simple rules to manage complex, process, complicated processes. And our last shift uh, is a shift from heroic leadership to transformational leadership. Uh, the example I will give of this is a company called Favi, and Favi, uh, this is the CEO of Favi at the time, Jean-Francois Aubris, and Favi is a brass foundry. They make brass parts out of brass and other copper alloys, and their biggest customer is the automotive industry. They're located in France, uh, kind of in a rural part of France, uh, and they employ about 600 people. Uh, Zobrist, when he took over as CEO uh, in the 1980s, Favi was a very traditionally run factory. Uh, he said that at the time, I think there were 400 employees, and he said uh, in the company there were about eight levels of hierarchy for 400 employees. So very hierarchically structured, right, traditional organization. Again, going back to that, uh, that idea of a, a military organizational structure. When Zobris took over, uh, the first thing he did as CEO was nothing. He did not take any action. He said what he wanted to do was be a tourist for four months. He wanted to tour the factory, and he wanted to learn how things worked before he came in and made any changes. And he started noticing things that just bothered him ethically. Uh, one of the things he noticed was that there was an employee uh, just sitting around with an old pair of gloves in his hand, and he was sitting around outside of a locked-up equipment locker. And so he walked up and he said, hey, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm waiting for the, the manager of the equipment locker to come uh, because these gloves are worn out and I need to uh, fill out the form and get a new pair of gloves. And Zobri said, really, how, how long have you been waiting here? He said, oh, I've been waiting maybe 10 minutes. Uh, he's usually here within the next five, so it won't be too much longer. And Zobri said, okay, thank you, and, and left him alone. Uh, he went back and he did a little bit of math and he found out how much that employee made per hour. And he said, that employee sat around for 15 minutes doing nothing. Uh, so that cost us X amount of money. Uh, how much does that pair of gloves cost? Oh, that pair of gloves costs less than we wasted in that person sitting around waiting to check out new gloves. And he said, so there was an economic reason not to do it. But he said, the reason I, I ended up making a change there was it seemed like we, di we didn't treat, trust our employees. And I do want to trust our employees. And so he changed that. He took the locks off the equipment locker. He said, this is the honor system now. If you need new equipment, go use it. Uh, if you need to borrow a tool and you want to take it home, fine, bring it back the next day. So he started to treat people like we trusted him. And he put a consequence in place. He said, so you don't have to check anything out anymore. But if we ever discover that somebody has stolen, it, you'll be immediately fired, immediately fired. So we're going to trust you completely. But if we find out that you violated that trust, then the relationship is over, right? Uh, and he started doing more and more things like this. Uh, one little change at a time based on the idea that we should trust our people. The next big change he made was he, he, uh, there used to be a big window on the second floor that overlooked the factory floor, and the management would observe the factory workers to make sure that everything was going smoothly. Uh, the second thing he did was he, brick, he took bricks and he completely covered that window so the management couldn't oversee the workers anymore. The third thing he did was remove the time clocks. He said, nobody's asking me to punch in and out on a time clock, so you clearly trust me. I want to show that I trust you the same way that you trust me. So there's no more time clocks anymore. And you should decide when you come in and just make sure that we have the right um, level of, of workers here. But you guys can figure that out. We trust you to figure it out. 
And what emerged over the years is that uh, they completely restructured their factory uh, into what they called mini factories. And so since car manufacturers are one of their largest clients, uh, they, there would be what they call a mini factory for Audi, a mini factory for Volkswagen. Uh, and the mini factories had what looks very much like a scrum team. They had a person that was in charge of sales, very much like a product owner, and a person that was in charge of the, the health of that mini factory, very much like a scrum master. These were fairly large, about 20 people in the mini factories each. Uh, but that was the only hierarchical layer. You had the salesperson, the factory mini factory leader, like the scrum master, and Jean-Francois. That was all of the hierarchy when they were done. Uh, so a very agile organization, but this example is more about this idea of transformational leadership. There are lots of interesting lessons to learn from this company. Uh, but Zobrist came in and he said, you know, I just believe that we should trust people. And he actually wrote a book in French about the company. It's called The Beautiful History of Favi, the company that believes that people are good. Right, so you see just theory why uh, permeating that, that view of leadership. And his job, he saw as transforming the organization into a human organization, uh, not to be the hero, not to come in and save the day, but to help people have more fulfilling jobs at, at work. And they have all of the results to back it up. Their, their company now is, uh, is by far the most successful European parts manufacturer. Almost every other Euro European company has outsourced all of their manufacturing uh, to lower cost um, uh, locations. So those are the eight organizational shifts. Uh, quite a lot of information there, a lot of, uh, a lot of stories. And um, at this point, you know, just to wrap it up, uh, what we're really trying to do is move the needle on Agile, right? We used to think of Agile as something that software development teams do, and it does that very well. But now we're starting to see that, you know, this is kind of status quo these days. Uh, the, the ability to do Agile at the team level is not an innovative practice anymore. It was absolutely innovative 15 and 20 years ago. Now it's becoming the status quo. If you're not doing Agile at the software team level, then it's pretty far behind the curve. Uh, we know that Agile software development is not about the processes as, nearly as much as it is about a mindset, those Agile values. And we know that structures are critical here that if we don't change organizational structures, it's really hard for a team to start to self-organize and get the real benefits out of Agile. When we shift into the organizational level now, uh, this is where management is innovating, right? Where we're seeing innovations in how organizational structures are built. These eight shifts are examples of real innovations in how we manage companies. Uh, all of these organizations take this idea of experimenting to learn. And so when I'm, when I'm coaching organizations about this, they'll say, well, you know, what, what structure should we use? What, what pattern should we use? What case studies should we study? And I always have to remind them that all of the case studies they might study did not change their organization to match somebody else. They ran experiments to learn what will work best for them. And because uh, this is such a radically different way, leadership is really a bottleneck. Uh, it's the bottleneck in creating organizations like this. Uh, that heroic leadership method does not work in an agile organization like this. But these agile organizations are the types of organizations that thrive in the complex world we have. Uh, and so really what we need is this uh, a real revolution in how uh, leaders think about their job. So we have, you know, pretty standard ways to teach teams to do agile software development. And we're excited that we're starting to figure out ways to do this side of things, right? Like the Scrum Alliance is offering the Certified Agile Leadership Program now. Um, we have things like great uh, Leadership 360s, which help leaders to develop these types of capabilities in order to do this. So we have only a few minutes left, so I apologize for uh, not leaving a little more time at the end here for uh, questions, uh, but we, we should have time for just a couple. Yeah, we have uh, five minutes. So we can take care of a couple of questions. Great. So just let me see. So uh, one question uh, we have here. As an employee, how could I know how agile my organization is? Great. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. For me, I'm, uh, I would want to know what the goal of comparing that is. How agile is my organization? I, I've always wanted to do this. Maybe I'll do it at some point. I've always wanted to build a very simple website that had four sliders on it. 
And the four sliders would just be uh, individuals and interactions on the left, processes and tools on the right, working software on the left, comprehensive, right, all four agile values, and allow people just to rate their organization by dropping that slider where they felt they were uh, as an organization. Because when we say, how agile am I? It's really about those values, it's about the mindset. Now, there are a lot of tools out there like the Comparative Agility Survey, for example. They go much more into the processes of Agile and are we doing these processes. I think that if we really want to compare agility, we should be talking about values and principles. So maybe somebody on the call, feel free to steal that idea, build a simple website that has four sliders, allow people to put a little information in so that they can collect information for them, their team, and their organization. Uh, but there are some tools out there. Uh, the, I, I would say the one that I... I'm most familiar with is something called the Comparative Agility Survey, and that will allow you to, to rate several areas and get some feedback for your organization compared to others. Okay, so moving on to the next one, uh, we have what role a leader plays in creating an agile organization? So uh, first we want to define what leader means, right? And, and I think a leader is anybody that is able to create an outcome that matters. Uh, and so, you know, there is that definition of a leader, which could be anybody on this call could take a leadership role. But we also have uh, leaders who have organizational authority, right? A more traditional view of leader kind of in the management. Um, and so the role of leaders there is really to uh, define what principles matter to the organization. All of the leaders of the organizations we looked at today started out with principles. They didn't start out with practices. And so a leader needs to be really clear about what, um, what principles matter for their organization to be successful. Like Zoe Briest felt like trusting the worker was the most important principle. And then they experimented to find the right practices uh, to align with those principles. So I think this is the role of leadership is to, is to help the organization align on principles and then to help the organization start to make changes that are not aligned with those principles. Okay, next one uh, we have, uh, how do scaling approaches like SAFE and uh, Scrum at Scale fit into this model? Uh, great question. Uh, so again, those, those models are trying to take something that works at the team level, uh, by and large, and scale it to kind of in a fractal way. Scrum at Scale is like an example of a fractal scaling model. Uh, scale Agile Framework is more like uh, Scrum wrapped in some other uh, more traditional structures. Uh, neither of those models uh, are really, in my experience, I haven't seen the case studies where those models have created lasting, innovative change in an organization. Now, there might be some people that have had that experience, but uh, instead, because I didn't find any examples of those in, in the world, that's why I started looking at these other organizations outside of the Agile space. Uh, even Geonetric, which is the example that we used here, uh, is not using a scaling framework, even though they use Scrum throughout the organization. They found that the scaling frameworks were too restrictive. And if you look at uh, one, of the, one of the shifts was from complicated processes to simple rules, some of the scaling frameworks start to conflict with that idea. Right? They, they, there is a lot of complicated process, for example, in something like SAFE uh, versus simple rules. Um, so, so my preference is to be simple rules, but I think that the scaling frameworks are a good way to get an organization from Scrum at the team level to one step further beyond that, how might we communicate? But uh, the principles, these eight shifts, are a little, I think, in my experience, uh, more effective at helping the organization grow their agility. Okay, I'm moving to the next one. Uh do these new approaches uh, still include the traditional Agile practices uh, like uh, Scrum, Kanban, and uh, Extreme Programming? Uh, I think they can. I think what happens is that the, uh, these organizations uh, can be much more um, at choice with those things. I'll give you one example of this is that uh, if in some of these organizations, the idea of something like a single product owner that gets to make decisions uh, it would be out of alignment. Like at Beertorg, there's not a product owner on their autonomous team. At Morningstar, there's no one person that makes the decision. So I think a lot of the practices uh, of Scrum, Kanban, and XP, I think was the third one you mentioned there, 
uh, are still very valuable because they're derived from a similar set of principles. Uh, but we, I think we see a less constrictive or kind of by the book use of those practices because those teams are going to be experimenting to learn. Okay, so we'll take two more questions and then we can uh, wrap up the session. Next one, uh, we have, uh, what if trust is broken in an agile organization? Stop following agile? Uh, uh, if trust is broken, broken, it's time for a retrospective, <laughs> right? Uh, when trust is broken, and it happens, right? Uh, I think sometimes we paint a picture of agile as this magical tool that repairs all relationships. It doesn't do that. It's built to expose when something's broken. So if trust is broken, uh, it's even more critical that we have somebody in a leadership role, whether that's a scrum master or some other type of somebody that just chooses to take a leadership role, that is going to, to, to bring it up and say, hey, trust was broken here. How do we start to repair that trust and start to build it back up again? Uh, or is this, an, is this irreparable harm that's been done to the relationship? So all the things that we know about relationships in our personal lives apply here as well, that when trust is broken, uh, somebody might say that they're okay, uh, but it takes time uh, to rebuild trust. And in an organizational context, uh, sometimes it's better to move on uh, from that relationship. Uh, and sometimes it's repairable. So an organization that really cares about uh, a trusting environment will take the actions required to talk about how the trust was broken, talk about why that happened, and talk about what steps we're going to take to repair it. It would be a great role for a scrum master that, that is skilled at that or, or bringing in an agile coach or, or some other type of a coach or facilitator to help with that. Okay, so the last one we have here, uh, what do you do when a company expects the scrum master to handle budgeting of the project? Uh-huh. Uh, I think the first thing that I would do is uh, ask them what do they want to get out of scrum? What is the company's goal for using scrum? Uh, now, you might start by saying, well, that's not how Scrum is built. That's not the role of the Scrum Master. That would probably be more like a product owner role uh, if budgeting is needed to be done. Uh, and so you could start by explaining why that conflicts with Scrum. However, what my experience is, is if you don't start by asking a leader, what, what do you want to get out of Scrum, then you're just telling them how to do their job. And that's usually not a good way to start a conversation. However, if you say, what, why do you want to use Scrum? What benefit do you want to get? Uh, and no matter what their answer is, then you can say, all right, if you want to get that outcome, we have some evidence here that Scrum is able to do that if we follow these few rules. Uh, and having the Scrum Master do the budgeting is probably preventing us from getting some of the benefit that we hoped to get out of Scrum. So that's where I would start, is making sure that that person actually understands what that leader or the organization hopes to get by doing Scrum. And then they can describe that, that what we would look as an anti-pattern, right? then they can describe why that anti-pattern is preventing them from reaching their goals. And it's not just, well, Scrum says so. That's usually not a good way to, uh, to make progress in a conversation. OK. So yeah, we have reached to the end of the session. Uh, thanks, Peter. Thanks for your time and for this wonderful session. Uh, we are already getting nice feedbacks on the chat window that it was great. a great webinar. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, related to the SEO information, you will get one category A SEO from this session. After one hour of uh, from this time, you will get uh, one email and all the steps will be there. If you have any follow up query regarding the recording SEO, any query uh, towards Peter, you can just go to our discussion forum and uh, post your query there. We will uh, take care of that and I can consolidate all the questions and I will share with you Peter great very much very good thank you so much Piali and thanks for all that it's ended yeah thank you all good night